You've been listening to The New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at New Trust Economy. Thanks for exploring the New Trust Economy with us. Hey, everyone, Tracy Hazard here on the New Trust Economy, and I'm excited to meet you, someone who helped me get a bit oriented. He may not have realized it, but it helped me get oriented in the blockchain, cryptocurrency space, and start to understand it. And he uses an analogy at every event, which I really appreciate, which is that he he talks about whether or not you understand the internet, like how it's made, how it's created, um, how it works. And, you know, and thinking about that, and, you know, most of us, like, think we know, But the reality is we don't know the understructure. We don't know the code itself behind that. And he likens that to the way that we think about blockchain today. And it really helped to open my eyes and seeing the blockchain for the new superhighway, the new infrastructure, as I call it all the time here on the show, that it's going to be and that we don't have to know how it works. Like we don't have to know the coding and the details. And I personally have the viewpoint that sometimes that's bad that you know that much about it, that it makes you too much in the tech weeds and hard to understand what the solutions, what the things that are going to come out of it, that are going to become valuable companies and businesses and tools that we're going to use in the future. So Stephen Mead, he's the founder of Big Bamboo. It's a holding company that accelerates ideas into the formation of companies. He's also the founder of the Beverly Hills blockchain, which is a uh, group and meetup that I met him at. Um, He has been a CEO for multiple companies and executive advisor with dozens of startups. He has the ability to rapidly scale capital revenue and customers by building and training teams. He's known as the bullseye guy. He has a podcast called the bullseye guy, and uh, he has a targeted approach for problem solving. He enables high-performing public, private, and nonprofit teams to focus on the specific goals that bring them success. Uh, He is passionate about world-changing companies as a mentor and executive. His nickname, the Bullseye Guy, is the result of his success at isolating exactly what organizations need and who they need to meet before they begin. And I can tell you, he brings together, he has used his networking skills for that, to connect people together. His rigorous focus on using sales psychology and communication to communicate simple ideas across a strategically targeted network of contacts evolved into what he calls the bullseye belief system. And he has used it to create, incubate, and architect nine different companies spanning the development of the internet, e-commerce, payment processing, and blockchain technology. And I know I'm going to get him to talk about Moneta Pro at some point here. And that is the one company that I do want you to hear about what they're building on blockchain. So, I am happy to meet, uh, have you meet Stephen Mead. Stephen, thank you so much for being here today. I um, am excited to talk with you because yeah, we haven't you. had much time to talk in person. Every time we're at an event, there's so much going on. <laughs> yeah, we always have to just wave at each other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How you doing? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I met you first at your event, though. So you've been mm-hmm. running some uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency events um, for some time. Um, tell us yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah, so I've, I've always run my own private networking events, but it's kind of funny. A friend of mine, uh, probably close to two years ago, made a joke that she had started a meetup for Blockchain Pasadena and had 42 people that had signed up. And I thought, well, I should do a meetup. So I started not on a lark. I just was interested. I started the Beverly Hills Blockchain Meetup, posted it. Overnight, I had 150 people. Within 24 hours, there was 300 and it's grown. There's probably 15 or 1600 people. Uh, so there was a lot of appetite on, on learning and knowledge and it just sort of grew organically and it's been a lot of fun. Well, you know, it was so interesting. So, you know, I went to one of your events, one of a good friend of mine, Dave mm-hmm. Phillips and grab, uh, took me there and, um, and we, uh, walked in and there were some people who he knew who would obviously be around who come every week, you know, every time you run it or every month. And, um, and then there was this large group of people who were just like, you know, deer cotton headlights, what's this thing. And so I talked to them at the networking afterwards and said, what made you come here? And, you know, just curious as to finding out and they're saying, I hear about this blockchain thing and I wanted to know more. And yeah. when you get down to it, they've got interesting businesses and interesting reasons for being intrigued. Are you finding that yourself? 
Yeah, and that was really the objective of the way I structured the meetup is because I, I come out of the entrepreneurial side. I've started 11 companies. I've actually had three public companies, OTC, kind of small bulletin boards. So I was fascinated with the crypto component, which to me is sort of glorified penny stocks. Crypto to me was the investment vehicle of a new way to raise money. The blockchain component's completely different. Blockchain to me is just a better form of a glorified database. And so the, the educational component of being distinctively different was something I wanted to kind of share. And then I think you saw from my audience, I've got a really eclectic but executive level of people. And I think a lot of them trusted me enough to know that if they came, they would get education that, that was sort of useful for them and not a lot of tech talk because I don't do tech talk. I do use case. Here's, here's how it works for you. <laughs> That's me too. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I'm always interested in the sort of the application of what's going on. And so, you know, I love that you have been incubating and growing so many companies over time and, and your business band, um, it, it, it's, um, uh, a, I love the title that you call it big bamboo. Because yeah, it's you. just, you know, that's such a, that's such a great way to put it because you want them to, you want to really put your time in and then they grow and grow and grow. Yeah. And so it's such a great metaphor for what, you know, what the type of business you want to grow. And um, so have you been seeing some great applications coming through and what have you been seeing kind of emerging from the networking group that you've been putting together? Well, so a couple of things. One, I, I appreciate the big bamboo compliment <laughs> and kudos. Thank you. Um, a quick story, since I've moved to and been in LA a lot more, people go, oh, you have bamboo. I have bamboo at my house in Malibu. And I had to go, no, I don't sell bamboo. It's a <laughs> metaphor for growing trees and how long it takes. Uh, but just for what it's worth, I've actually moved my branding over and now I'm officially called the bullseye guy. Which I love too. I was yeah, going to mention that. So, yeah. too much. so the bullseye has taken this target of things and specifically drilling down to exactly what you want. And that's everything from exactly what you want from a business partner, from a message. So the, the segue to your question was, I'm a big proponent of targeting how things work as, as what it means is how it works for you, not how it works technically. Uh -huh. And a lot of the things that were coming out in blockchain, especially in Hollywood and entertainment, everybody's got an idea. L LA, everybody's selling something. <laughs> And most of the things they were selling were like bad scripts and movies. Everybody thinks their movie's going to be the best. And people thought, oh, my blockchain's the greatest idea ever. And most of them aren't. Um, yeah. I, I joke that blockchain is a lot of what I call bees. And I just did a podcast on this one that, that we'll share later. It's full of baffle, babble, and bull beep. <laughs> if you get past those three bees, there might be something brilliant. Mm. But most of it is baffle, babble, and bullshit. So how do you really determine that when you're looking at something and evaluating? What are some criteria that you have when you're looking at the ideas that people are presenting forward? Well, well, first, and again, the, one of the speeches I gave was unblocking the blockchain. And I would trick people because I'm a trained speaker. I'd say, how many of you know how the internet works? And everybody raises their hand. <laughs> and I put up a screen of HTML programming. And I'm like, that's how the internet works. That's program code. And they're like, no, I don't get yeah. that. <laughs> I said, how does it work for me? Here's my website. I know how a website works from a business application. I don't know how the technology works. So when people would come to me with these blockchain ideas, I would just reverse engineer it. I'd say, okay, how does this make what you're doing better? Trying to come in and say, oh, you're going to earn crypto tokens for watching videos. So you get the paid to watch videos. I would ask a simple question. How's that any different than points in YouTube? Oh, oh no, it's crypto. It's a token. I'm like, well, wait a minute. YouTube already has the video platform. People already watch it. If they gave you points for watching videos, explain to me how blockchain makes points better. You know, how does it make tokens better? And when you challenge people on, how does it make what you're doing better? A lot of times it didn't. It, it was just a buzzword that people were jumping in saying, oh, we're blockchain. And, and the last kind of <laughs> point to that now is people look at me and they, because we have one called Minetapro, oh, are you a blockchain company? And I look at them straight face. Are you an internet company? Well, well because to me, the internet is the enabler underneath all kinds of industries and ideas. 
we're no more an internet company than we are a database company, than we, we use JavaScript and Perl and com objects, and we use all this technical crap. Doesn't mean we're a blockchain company. We use blockchain to perform a certain task. And that's what I try and help people. How do you evaluate what that task is? Does blockchain make the solution and problem you're trying to solve better? And in some cases, yeah, it does. That's, and most of that's it so correct. You know, that's so smart. And that's actually what, you know, as I've been evaluating it, and part of the journey for why I started the podcast, why I uh, started to be interested in it, um, happened because I am interested in it as a solution to a part of my business problem. Yeah. And as I was looking at it, you know, parts of it could easily be solved with just a different type of database, you know, just running your database a little bit different, running your systems a little bit different. But there is part of it that I've come to recognize over time that a smart contract creates a level of trust and a level of um, service that's unlike anyone else can do in the, in the marketplace. And it would run in a way in which it would be easy to manage where the accounting would be a nightmare otherwise. And it would yeah. always be suspect, which happens a lot in Hollywood, I mind you, because I've talked to a lot of people calculating royalties and calculating like who gets what and when it gets issued. There's so much lawsuits that go around in that. Like that's a ripe place for a blockchain to be put in because of the problems that result from it. Yeah. And so, but it's not a total solution for my company. It, as you put it, it's one of the many tech tools that I might use or the resources that I might use. It's only one piece of that. Yeah. And that's a great example because for Hollywood and entertainment, the the industry has been trying to solve DRM, digital rights management, for a long time. How do you audit a universal music to make sure you're getting paid properly? And, and so these new smart contracts do something better than the internet and a database. It's, they're almost intelligent algorithms, meaning if a song is purchased, that program can delineate exactly who gets paid. And there is no middleman. The payment doesn't go to the to the label and then the label does it and pays the artist royalties at some point later. So it's, it's this evolution of technology solving a problem. And I think blockchain will have a huge impact on, on DRM, digital rights management, artist capability to sell direct, all the way down to micropayments. I like agree. The, yeah, the yeah. distinction between blockchain and cryptocurrency and digital currencies, the opportunity for somebody to get paid two, three, five, eight, ten cents on a 99 cent download, the new technologies accomplish that. The internet can't do it efficiently. Credit card networks can't do it. So the, this technology is evolving to solve problems, but those are real world problems. Right. Tokenizing a pizza is not a, a problem that needs to be solved. It, it just sounds cool and yeah. yeah, exactly. That's right. So what other types of use cases have you been seeing coming out in the marketplace that you've been saying, wow, that solves a really good problem. It's a really great example of blockchain. Uh, well, not to be self-serving, ours is, is relatively unique. There's a lot of, of press. We've actually won eight contests around the world. So we built a system called Mineta Pro. And, and real quick, it's not self-serving, but I think it's a good use case for people to understand. Think of Amazon for a moment. Amazon's a big global marketplace. Amazon's done really well. Amazon's not on blockchain, doesn't have crypto or tokens. It's a marketplace. We built a marketplace for large businesses, companies like Ford, who trades cars for computers. So we built a system where Ford can list cars, trade them to another company, get back electronic credits, not a blockchain or a token, a store credit, use that to buy other assets. It's a closed marketplace. Now, when Ford transfers a thousand cars, they have two problems, and you mentioned one of them earlier. Problem one, they have an inventory module. Their accounting system's out of balance because they have a thousand cars that are missing. Right. So we write our invoice, right? Any of you that go to Amazon, click on your order history, you get a, a history of, of your orders. That doesn't do anything. Our order history writes to the IBM distributed ledger component of the blockchain. It's just a better database. Now our invoice communicates with their inventory module. So when a thousand cars are transferred, we can go into their inventory, remove a thousand cars and keep them in compliance. It's, it's, a, it's a balancing tool. But right. you can't take a million dollars of inventory out and not prove it went somewhere. So you mentioned again earlier, we use a lightweight smart contract a blockchain contract to prove those assets were transferred to a third party. So it's an audit trail. 
the smart contract is an evolution from a PDF. We could do a PDF, but PDFs can be opened in Adobe Acrobat, broken, manipulated. That smart contract goes across with a timestamp and serial numbers, the way I explain it to people. Yeah. And if it gets changed, then there's a new serial number, so you know something's been modified. So we're using blockchain in the underbelly of a marketplace to update inventory modules and provide an audit trail. I love that. It, you know, it's such a great example. And you mentioned using the IBM business blockchain, which mm. I just interviewed Jerry Cuomo from IBM. Okay. And, and he was talking about how they have a great sandbox over there to be able to build in it. How did yeah. you guys find that? What, did you find it really useful and helpful? And why did you choose IBM's blockchain? Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a yes, no, and a maybe. Let's, let me reverse <laughs> engineer into it. Please. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, this is from an entrepreneurial standpoint. It's kind of a good methodology of how we arrived at where we did. So we wanted to have blockchain integrated into our marketplace, Mineta Pro. Step one, we could build a proprietary blockchain. I've got some of the best technologists in the world. We could have built our own. That would have given us enterprise value. So if we go raise money, we could tell a venture guy, oh, we have proprietary blockchain technology. Added value, but not as much. Step two, we could build on existing technology. So we looked at Graphene, we looked at EOS. We love the, the EOS team, it just wasn't ready. We looked at BitShare, we looked at Multichain, we looked at IBM, Hyperledger, and Fabric. We looked at eight or nine different blockchains, chain technologies we could build on. Ultimately, my customer with Mineta Pro are the largest companies in the world. We, we sell primarily CFOs of big automotive companies, so Ford, Caterpillar, United Airlines. If I walk in and say, oh, we've got proprietary blockchain technology, we're, we're kicked out of the box right away. We're a startup with proprietary, they don't understand it. Right. We walk in and say, oh, we built our invoicing platform on IBM Hyperledger. We can communicate with SAP and Oracle. We move to a next level conversation. So right. whether IBM was the best or not wasn't a concern of ours because we're not using IBM for transaction speed. You know, the, the blockchain purists hate IBM. Oh, the speed slow. That I'm like, guys, I'm using it for a specific function. So yeah. from that standpoint, they're performing a function, which led us to what you're talking about. Adam uh, Mastrelli, the team that runs the IBM group out of New York. Uh, we're, we're great. We actually did a three-day planning session with them, went in, they whiteboarded, architected, we figured out. So the good news was it cost us some money, but we were able to architect into the IBM platform. The downside is, and this is again, entrepreneurial for anybody doing this, IBM's job and goal is to sell services. So we're in whiteboarding out and they're giving us, oh, well, you should do this and you need a private node and you need a this and a that. And I'm like, no. We're hiring you to build this. I know exactly what I want you to do. So we went in with a very clear line of what we needed. If we didn't have that, they, and, and again, to their credit, they want to stack all these services and all these things on top. Um, but at the end, it, it works great. We actually are, we're, we're, I believe we're the first company in the world about to come out of testnet with IBM and we're running on Amazon Web Services. So there's some cool things coming where we're the first, I believe, enterprise blockchain running on AWS cloud, Microsoft into SAP and Oracle. So I know that's a bunch of ABCs, awesome. but it's like a big... <laughs> yeah, no, but you know, deal. it's so right because this is part of what I've been thinking about in my business. And as I've been having conversations with IBM as well, you know, thinking about this is that my goal is to ultimately create a smart contract that does big brand advertisement contracts, yeah. right? So, um, and so the connection up with those big brands and then be able to make micro payments out to all of the different podcasters at all the different levels. And so yeah. when I think about that, I have to integrate in with their systems and that's what in my research I've been coming back to. So that being a great criteria for you, that helps me validate it's, what I've been sort of seeing myself. So everyone out there who's been considering that, this is these are the kind of yes. checklists in our head we need to go through. These are criteria that matter. You have to, you have to reverse engineer it. WPP, IPG, Orion, Trade Group, these guys are all running complex accounting systems, primarily SAP and Oracle. They've, they've got yeah. modules within SAP and Oracle. The small business world runs on QuickBooks, and then the entrepreneur runs on a spreadsheet. If right. you're trying to play up at SAP and Oracle, that big enterprise level, 
you actually somewhat need a big enterprise company for the big companies to feel comfortable. And that was, that was why we landed on IBM. It was um, a little more expensive than if we'd built on multi-chain or built on our own, but the credibility acceleration just moves us into the conversation because again, the bullseye for me is who's my customer. My customer target is a fortune 500 company who wants to do business with somebody they know and trust. It's easier to say, Oh, we've integrated into IBM to touch your asset modules. Right, right. Oh, I have to be careful too in the Me Too movement. That wasn't meant to be anything other than technical. <laughs> no problem. I, I didn't take it that way. So, you know, but thinking about the bullseye blockchain, right? The blockchain bullseye of, of our, of a, I think where yeah. a lot of entrepreneurs and, and business owners start to struggle here is, you know, this business plan problem. So I can say that I've probably been ruminating over this for almost the whole year. And at the end of the day, my business plan problem is the same, that I don't even know how much to plan for. Like, how much should I plan in, in evaluation? And where can I go get good information of someone who's not just going to, like, stack it all up and start selling to me? How do I evaluate what my realistic budget should be so I can put this in my plan? Because some of us do have outside capital funding or we have, we have board members we yeah. have to, you know, account to. And, and again, this is, so the bullseye belief system that I created, I read when I was 22, I went into sales training, selling insurance, mutual funds, and mortgages. To, to sell life insurance at night to your friends, you have to get really good. <laughs> yes, and to recruit do. people to go sell that, you have to get really, really, really good. Uh, so I read about 357 books in six and a half years, developed this system, and it's 10 steps. You're talking about step nine of my 10. Right. Step nine for me is I take meetings early and often, meaning I get access to my potential customers. I get access to potential program or development teams. But the question I lead with is why won't this work? Um, so I go in saying, Hey, here's what we're thinking about building. Why won't this work? You know, what, why won't it work? Why won't it work within your organization? What would I be up against? What's my competition? You know, I'm, I'm interested in soliciting negative feedback and the negative feedback really gives you the objections either within a corporation or the program teams. Like I can go to a program team saying, Hey, I'm thinking of building on multi-chain or stellar. Why won't this work? What, if you were to be my development team, why won't this work? What would you do differently? And we end up getting feedback and that feedback helps us refine so that refined that plan do. to its nice, narrow detail. Yeah, yeah. And so by, yeah. by soliciting the negative feedback, I've learned that that's just a tremendous, because otherwise we're overselling. Look what we built and you're the advertising. And isn't this great? Look, I can solve all these problems for you. And I went in saying, why won't this work? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, a, this is so in alignment. So um, most of the listeners already know this, but you may not, Stephen. So my role um, over the last 27 years has been to design and develop products for consumer markets. So okay. I've designed lots of products that you buy every day at mass market, um, Costco, Walmart, Target. And this is exactly our success model. So our success model is to very early and often connect in, not with your fans and your followers and your friends and family on your great invention or your great product idea, but to connect with the end user and the value chain through the process. So like the retailer, yeah. whoever's got to sell it, right? So you have a chain through that. And so in that sales chain model, this is where we find out the biggest objections. Why won't people put this on the shelf? And then why wouldn't you pick it off the shelf, right? Like at the end of the day, the earlier we get the negative feedback yeah. on that, the better we can design the product to actually succeed. And it has flipped our model from the consumer product has seven out of 10 failures and we have 86% success rate, yeah. having done over 250 products just in the last decade alone. I, I so you will, see the model shift. I, I will, I'll give you one that I think you will appreciate along those lines. Uh, years ago, we have a product we're probably gonna bring back to market. I, I created, it's technically a consumer product for water conservation. So it saves water, plastic, power, pollution, and money, 60 seconds, consumer doesn't change their habits. Like it's a great story. But it was a box that goes in a toilet, it saves water, you know, it, and it had a whole story around it. And the guy that I knew ran Walmart. He was head of Walmart merchandising. And I met him at a conference when he was trying to pull Walmart.com up and didn't have it. And I had one of the very first iPads ever and nobody had seen an <laughs> iPad. 
I'm like, oh, hey, Matt, here, I'll show you. Let me pull it up. And his website was broken and didn't work. So I, I ingratiated myself early to him. But he had this product. He's like, I love it. We'll put it on the shelves of Walmart. This will be great. And I turned him down. And investors were like, why would you turn him down? And kind of to your point, I'm, I, and I've done retail before, I, I said, why won't this work? If he put my product in Walmart, where does it go? I, we couldn't figure out, is it in toys? Is it home furnishing? Is it in kitchens? So it didn't have a category. A, didn't have a category. And then if it had a category, it didn't have an end cap or a story or a placement or marketing. So I'm gonna have a product on the shelves that nobody knows what it is. And then Walmart's gonna send them back to me in a buyback. This is the biggest problem with innovation in, in the mass market, right? If it doesn't have a place in the store, so doesn't have no one will ever see it. Yeah. yeah. And so people who don't understand, they're like, oh, well, why would you turn down Walmart? I'm like, well, here's a good example. Yeah. We didn't know, I'm smart enough to know, I don't have a category of where this would fit. And I don't have a story to drive the adoption within the, the retail market. It's going to sit on the shelves and fail. Right. And, you know, and uh, category, new category development does happen. It just doesn't happen in the mass market, right? So, and it doesn't happen for free. You, you have yeah, to it doesn't happen for free. Brand. But this is what most people think. They would think, oh, yes, but Walmart's a win, right? Yeah. And this is what we might think with any of our businesses, right? Oh, it's just a win to be a part of this. The reality is, is when it's a loss there, though, it's a business killer. And yeah. that's why you were very smart to turn that down. Yeah. And so the, this concept of why won't this work? I've had friends in retail and I've asked them, you know, oh, was this successful? Why not? What? And, and Walmart's a tricky one because they, they do force you to take back inventory and people don't realize that. So, yeah. you know, if, if you learn where the tricky. pitfalls <laughs> are, then, then you can work around them. Yeah. So that's one of my big tips is take meetings early and often when you're building a product, but go in humbly, not saying I've got the greatest thing in the world, go in saying, hey, we built this. I think it's cool. Why won't this work? And that's your real feedback. I love that. That's really great. So, well, back to, you know, so the business plan side and the dollar mm -hmm. side of things, have costs started to come down in the development side? Are you starting to see that shift over happen now that, you know, IBM's through a lot of its process and now oh they're gosh. moving into more? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the system we built that Mineta Pro is running on when we first built it, it was 19 or 20 years ago. It's almost six and a half million dollars to build the hosting on it was 50 to 80,000 a month. They actually, they didn't even have remote hosting. So between cloud services now, between development tools, between, you know, off the shelf software, between the red hats of the world and the ability, again, I joke before the internet, there was no internet. <laughs> right. So the internet enables you and I now to, to talk on Skype and things like that. But we've got development teams. I've got a dev team in Argentina because they were the best, programmers for what I needed for one. We've got another dev team in India. We've got a third one in Belarus. So technology enables you now to drive your costs down, but still get a better level of service. The, the outsourcing with hosting, but whether it's Amazon Web Services, which we love, Azure, which is, you know, is pretty good. You can run a system. We've got Magmo, our photo sharing tool, runs out on Microsoft Azure for under a hundred bucks a month. Yeah. Years ago, Isn't that, that amazing been, how it's come down? Yeah. Oh, we would have had to have a dedicated server for thousands of dollars. And it, yeah, so technology compression has happened. Communication like this, the compression of technology and time has made development cheaper. Plus, I see a bunch of things behind you, like, right? Like yeah. I've got the pretty Van Gogh almonds. You've got all these even you, you can see I'm obviously a little bit of a designer here with yeah. my color studies behind me, right? But, yeah. but, but that's kind of my point is the graphical tools exist now where you can do graphical mockups of websites and clickable prototypes. There's so many things you can do in graphic form before you go to programming. Yeah. You used to have to program stuff to see if it's going to work. Now you can actually build a clickable prototype and go to potential investors or customers saying, hey, here's what I'm going to build. What do you like? It's easier to move a button on a template like a PDF than it is to move the programming. Right. So that my partner, uh, you know, my co-host here, Monica um, Prophet, she, um, that was, you know, uh, I don't know, it was probably maybe 20 episodes ago or so right yeah. now, but she was so excited to show off her, pro her prototype. Right. Yeah. And of course it has none of the functionality underneath it. It's not coded in. It's a in. fake clickable but prototype. You know flake. where the clickable buttons are and it just flips to a page. 
but it looks, it yeah. gives you this reality of, oh, this is what I'd be buying and this is what I'd be right. building. And it's so valuable both on your end that you achieved your goals before all that coding happens. And it's really valuable in, in doing what you were just talking about and getting this, why won't it work? Well, so that's it, the great feedback loop you can get. And this is where it gets fun. And so now if you have a clickable prototype, now you can go to your developers and get costs and, and quotes. So now I can send a clickable prototype to a developer. They come back not only with a quote, but feedback of things they can do, different languages, modifications. So I might have six, eight, 10 teams that are looking at it. I'm getting feedback and refining it every time. So by the time yeah. we go to development, we've had multiple people look at it. We've refined the technology and terminology. We've looked at what language it should be written on. In the old days, you, it, old days, like we, we all sound so old. But <laughs> the old days yeah, when yeah. we built it, uh, yeah. When you ask if I it got quicker, that. it's quicker and better now. And the <laughs> graphical tools, I think, are a huge part of it. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, things like e-commerce and how that all fits in the system, you definitely don't want to build this stuff twice. You want it to be right. It needs to be smooth. It needs to be trustworthy. Like all of those things have to be built in nowadays. I recall, you know, creating carts from scratch back in 1998 for our first business and creating just the cards. scariness of what we did. <laughs> You're talking about shopping carts. Shopping carts. Yeah. Oh, all kinds okay. of that. So here. Yeah, yeah, future. So March of 1996, I was getting out of financial services. I wanted to write a, a book for networking. I wanted three things. Again, bullseye, target. I want somebody to build a website, process credit card orders, like my 800 service, send me checks and mailing labels. I want to talk on stage and cash checks. I'm good at talking and cashing, everything in between. Didn't exist. So I'm all the way in early 1996. We launched our company, Virtual Sellers. We built one of the world's first proprietary shopping carts. We used our merchant account to process the credit card orders. I could have a company up online in under an hour, 10 products, $100 under an hour. And we were using neuro-linguistic programming. We were moving buttons around, left, right brain symmetry. So I built the company and took it public in March of 99 with proprietary shopping cart and transaction processing. That's what went on to become PayPal. So you wow. were still trying to solve it in 98. I was still trying to solve it in 98. We yeah, had, because <laughs> we had started working on it in 96. So people don't realize back then there, there were no shopping carts. There weren't security. Oh. You didn't have internet enabled merchant accounts. Yeah, we yeah. were the first in the world with that. That's it. When it, whenever my clients complain about, oh, WordPress is so complicated, I look at them like, you're nuts. Yeah. Like, this is nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why I said, so the tools have come a long way, which makes things a lot better. Uh, but but WordPress and the clickable prototypes and PD, PSDs and Photoshop, you can build a lot of things before you actually build anything. Right. So now you're you're the bullseye guy, and yeah, uh, are that. you? <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that. Actually, it's it's such a great it's such a great term for now. Having met you multiple times and seen you speak at events, I'm like, yeah, this totally makes sense yeah, to you. what you're talking about. <laughs> Much better brand for you. Um, you know, are you helping companies? What what is it that you're doing in the business, and and how does that tie into the networking events that you run? Well, so I don't do a lot of outside capital. We fund our own products internally. Uh, I do do some work on advisory boards, but what I'm really good at is I'm good in an hour with somebody to sit down and refine their message, figure out what they need, who their targets are. Uh, so I can do that with friends of mine, but it's not scalable and duplicatable. So I did no, no self, you know, a, a facing plug here, but the bullseyeguy.com, I have a podcast out there. Yep. And on the bullseyeguy.com, I've got all kinds of these podcasts designed to transfer knowledge to other people. I like awesome. building companies that help other people be successful at what they're passionate about. And so transferring this knowledge is what I've tried to do is, is take these techniques and say, here, you can go learn how to get better. I want to help you get better. 
I love that. So yes, exactly. This is kind of where I lie with my product business. So product launch hazards, as uh, many people do know, yeah. is where I give away all my product knowledge because I no longer, I no longer take consults. I no longer do that. So, but I've got to transfer the knowledge to them because wow, it would be so valuable to so many people. So that's fabulous that you've uh, decided to pull that all into a, a podcast and and move that out for your for your audience and for yeah, all the scale people who and duplicate it. and give back. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So are you continuing more with the Beverly Hills blockchain group and, and what, what are you seeing the shift of it happen now that, you know, we're farther in, yeah. in blockchain and, and crypto than we've been before? It, it, it's a good question. So the, the format that I did was one I had never done before. The format for the Beverly Hills blockchain were three presenting companies, five to seven minutes, because at the time these ICOs and these things raising money were very hot. And so I would try and bring in one that was very early one that had had a little bit of success and then ones that had raised money. I mean, we brought in EOS that had raised billions of dollars and the guys out of the UK had raised a hundred million. So the format was three presenting companies and then 20 minutes on knowledge, not mm. selling anything, but transferring knowledge. The problem within the blockchain industry is that a lot of that enthusiasm's collapsed around the finance and the ICO side. I'm not an event guy. I did those because I wanted to give the knowledge back not sell sponsorships and try and sell things. So that particular format, I don't know that we can, the only way we could relaunch it is if somebody came in that wanted to try and get sponsors as an event person. That, yeah. that's, that's not me. So we're probably still doing, and we've done one or two, we'll still do um, a meetup type of happy hour, but it'll be yeah. more organic. It's 5.30 to 8.30, get good people in the room, make qualified, tangible, targeted introductions. So you at least meet the right people when you're in the room and don't bounce around wondering who's there. Yes. So we're still getting people together. Just the format had to change because the, the industry changed. I mean, it was, yeah. it was hot and then it's not. So now thinking about your, you know, your number nine, your getting meetings early and yeah, often and, early and sort and of often. breaking stuff. <laughs> what do you think is not working? In, in the in in the, the blockchain industry? in the crypto and oh, that this breakdown um, here yeah, what do you um, think's not working there, that people really there, need to change there's a ton of things but i i think some of the top level one is messaging mm. i think the messaging screwed up because the people doing the messaging pardon my french are idiots <laughs> to call everything cryptocurrency when they're not a currency is a misnomer to right. call things crypto and bitcoin and blockchain all the same they're not yeah. Blockchain is the underlying framework technology. We use blockchain to update an inventory module. You may use it for digital. So there, the, people conflate everything together. They say everything's crypto and it's not. So I think the messaging's really been screwed up. Bitcoin to me is like a glorified brick of gold. It's an investment asset, a certain unit, whether it's $10,000 or a hundred thousand, I don't care because I can only afford $50 of it. Right. So that runs on blockchain, but Bitcoin's its own animal. Cryptocurrencies are not currencies. They're tradable tokens. They're like glorified penny stocks. Right. And I just did a podcast. I'm not trying to self promote my podcast, but I have, no, I get this information out. Investing is speculative. If you're an angel investor, nine out of 10 investments don't make it. If you're early series A, you've got a better chance, but, but it's higher risk, less reward. As you move up, OTC bulletin boards, penny stocks. They're risky, but it's easier for a penny stock to go from two cents to four cents to 10 cents, and you can get liquidity. In an angel investment, you don't have liquidity. Above right. the OTC, you've got NASDAQ. Above NASDAQ, you've got the stock exchange. You wanna be safe? Great, go buy Apple or Amazon and hope it's not the next BlackBerry. Like they're all yeah. risky. So people have, have pushed the crypto world down as oh, it's all risky and speculative. No, it's an asset class that is historically risky, in my opinion. It's like the bulletin boards, these pink sheets. They're risky, but a crypto token gives you potential liquidity where angel investing doesn't. Right. I think the, my, my biggest frustration is twofold. One, messaging. And two, the biggest challenge for startups, the reason the majority of them fail is not market or management, it's money. Mm. They don't usually have enough money because we as entrepreneurs are always begging angels to give us money. And then we got to go beg for a series A and 
Then we're up in Silicon Valley begging for more. Like we're always begging for money and the guys are beating us down. It's, it's horrible, but that's the nature of capital. Right. Blockchain crypto token world potentially breaks that out. So a lot of these projects raise 20, 30, 50, 80, $100 million. I wish there had been and hopefully will be more successful projects that came out of this first round of ICOs. I don't know the will. I think it's back like the internet. There were a bunch of early things that didn't work, you know. And then it got everybody scared. You know, this is a thing that I, I liken this to, and I give, gave a speech about it this summer, that um, that the I see that I saw the same thing in other disruptive technologies, right? Yeah. We look at that with um, so 3D printing. That's actually how I got started in podcasting, and um, although I've been 3D printing for decades, yeah. Um, so you know, in our businesses, that's how we prototype, right? So we had more experience than most people on it, but that we most people were whining and complaining that the capital is drying up and now all this, ta you know, now all this great tech's not going to make it to market. And I was sitting back with, I think you have a bigger problem set that the reason it's not making it to market is because there's so much that won't work that hasn't been rebuilt in the chain, right? right? Um, in how it's going to get to market that it's just not going to happen. And, um, and so I looked at it from a different way for failure. But they were. This is the same thing that happens as it hits that point where there's so many failures, money does dry up. Yeah. But it's at the previous yeah. stage though. This is where things went wrong, and that's what I see is that if they followed your model and they followed mine, they would get a product market fit dialed in, and that's actually where about in my research, it's 56% of failures happen from a mismatch between what the product, what the product fitting, how the market needs to buy it or accept it or or do that is your, in your model, and or they have a great market but they built the wrong product for it because they didn't ask them any questions, yeah. and so those. Fit. If they fix that, they wouldn't have had so many failures in that early days. They sat in their tech bubble, you know, and they they didn't reach out and ask those questions and really get that feedback. So they built the right thing that could succeed from the beginning and they hurt the marketplace for everyone. Yeah. And again, these are all, and these are great. These are all things that I've talked about as well, because you hear the classic, here's my air quote classic. Oh, I don't bet on the, the horse. I bet on the jockey. Yeah. And I'm like, really? I bet on the market. I said, if you put a, you can put the best jockey in the world on a, on a donkey, he's not going to win the Kentucky Derby. Meaning if the market's not big enough, I want a big, big, big market that even if other good jockeys come in, you have a chance to win. Right. And, and people look at management. I get it. But to me, market product customer fit, who's your customer? How yeah. do you get that chasm? Capital follows customers. Like, Customer acquisition has to be number one and size of market allows you to capture it. And, and again, Amazon's a good example. We compare ourselves to Amazon and my joke is, oh, Mineta Pro, if it works, will be bigger. And people go, oh, you're, how do you compete with Amazon? I say, I don't. Amazon's in a $20 trillion market of what's called retail commerce. Right. Amazon's total revenue is about $240 billion. They have 1.5% of their potential addressable market. Amazon's insignificant out of the total 20 trillion, but as a market, they're huge. Right. We're going after a $17 trillion market and there's no marketplace for it. So I looked at total addressable market and back then going, hey, who can be the players? If you look at Amazon, there's Amazon and Alibaba and eBay, multiple players in a big market. Yeah. I'll take that over a great jockey in a horrible market. <laughs> I, I so, so agree. Well, Stephen, is there anything else you want to let us know before we go and anything that you, you know, uh, you know, risks, things that you want the market to know about the, the, the businesses out there to pay attention to? Um, no, I mean, a, a lot of my information, like I said, is on the bullseyeguy.com. So anybody that wants to, to learn more can go there. Um, just do yourself a favor. If you're an investor, don't give up on the industry and the market. Find good projects, find things that are coming to market that you believe in, but keep investing. But understand the distinction. Crypto and blockchain are not conflated. They're mutually exclusive. The crypto assets run on top of the blockchain, just like enterprise software, just like financial transactions, just like digital rights management. Learn the industry and then find things you're passionate about. And then the last one is ask how blockchain will make that process better 
That's what you need to understand. You don't need to understand how it works technically. How does it work tactically to make something better? Because that's the real problem people need to solve. Right. When it's solving a problem, it always has a better shot at success yeah, exactly. than something that is, you know, we think we have a problem, right? You yeah. know, oh, we'll educate the market on that. And we don't want to do You're that. Creating a problem <laughs> that, that doesn't need to be solved. Exactly. Well, Stephen, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. Pleasure. Everyone will be able to message you, get, Perfect, get in touch you. with you right through the blog post for this episode. And that will be at newtrusteconomy.com. So Great. thanks everyone for listening today. I'm Tracy Hazard and I'll be back next time with a cool and interesting person to talk to in blockchain innovation. At least you didn't say more cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thanks right, so right, much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. You've been listening to The New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring The New Trust Economy with us.